Heavenly Father, we praise you for this day, giving honor and glory unto you through your one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for the work of your Spirit and how you work through the written and scripturated word by the power of your Holy Spirit. The depth of our sin is so great, Lord, that we kick against your government and your word, and yet we are in still in need of government. For the broad world and the cultures of this world Lord, I'm thankful for our nation, from traveling to other places, I have seen how awful government really can be. Lord, you know our great concerns for our nation and our government as is, and yet at the same time we praise you that you have not allowed this nation to be as far gone as many others. We ask, though, Lord, that you be merciful to us and that you deal with our leaders so that we will not go down further roads of sinfulness and difficulty. We pray for their souls, each and every one of them, from the president and his staff to the Congress, the Senate, the Supreme Court, we lift them up to you. We pray for our state and local leaders, each of their souls. You know them by name and you know their hearts. I pray for local leaders in our counties. Lord, so many have gotten to a place where they have forgotten the importance of who you are and all that is said and done through even local government. And yet, Lord, we ask for your mercy upon us as the church. For until you bring some revival to this land, it seems like many in our government will go the way of the sinfulness of the world. Will you help the church? Will you lead us and guide us that we would keep the gospel central? That we would keep our lives central before the world? That we would realize that we are the ones that are the city on a hill? So many Christians talk about the importance of this next election and yet their, their lives are not in any way, in any semblance in accordance with the truth of your word. Even the Republican Party, which has been considered so conservative, Lord, just had a porn star speak at the National Convention. Had a woman lift up the name of Vishnu in prayer, as the one true living God, and there were people all over the convention, white, black, Hispanic, who bowed their heads in prayer to that God, and yet they tell us that the Christian God is important. Both parties have gone wayward. They are not seeking to bow themselves before you. And if they continue in this way, leading the people of this nation in this way, you will not bless this nation. So Lord, we ask your mercy upon us. Please change the hearts and souls and minds of men and women. That they will not kowtow to worldliness. Please, Lord. We come before you, the only one true living God of all ages, creator of heaven and earth. 
and ask that you move in our nation according to your will for your purpose and your glory. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5, we left last week saying Christ is the Son who was sent as the covenantal priest. Christ is the Son who was sent as the covenantal priest. We noted from verse 5b, He is the eternal priest. And we began to look into the context uh, of that from verses 5 and 6. And we were moving along into uh, verses 7 or verse 7. He is the ordered priest in time. Come in flesh. And we were looking that from in the sense of verse 5 and onward. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Last week we, or excuse me, two weeks ago, we left off uh, with the sense of understanding the phrase, you are my son, from uh, the Old Testament Hebrew, um, that, that sense of uh, his being, his deity, his divinity, that the son and the father are one, you are my son, the son referring to himself as the I am in the Gospel of John. And we were noting the context of the eternal generation of the Son. Today I have begotten you in that context of the Father and the Son are one. There's never a time when the Son was not. Um, and verse 6 says, just as he also has says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I'm not going to avoid this verse, uh, but I am going to pass over it for just a, a time. The reason why, it's mentioned again in verse 10 of this same chapter, but chapter 7 brings Melchizedek back up with more detail. And so, I don't want to say everything in the context of, of what I might understand or what could be said, because when we get to chapter 7, we're going to have to spend a lot of time unfolding the idea of him being in the order of Melchizedek. But I'll, I'll simply uh, open that up with this sense of recognizing, as Matthew Henry and Thomas Scott noted, that he's already mentioned him in the order of Aaron. That's been in the previous part of the verse. The order of Aaron giving him a, a mosaic context in the sense of this priesthood that would come out of the, the mosaic context. All of the sacrificial laws uh, were given in that context in great detail. But was there an order of priesthood even before Aaron? And the Hebrews writer is saying, you, you need to look to the priesthood of Christ in a greater context than even just the order of Aaron. He's greater than Aaron, but there was a time when there was a priest mentioned in the uh, Melchizedek, and he is in a sense given an order that to us has a greater context to the whole of his priesthood. He says the priesthood of Christ after the order of Melchizedek was to be personal. And the high priest, immortal as to his office, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. There's something here with the order of Melchizedek that we'll deal with later that gives it a greater context of Christ being high priest than just being of the order of Aaron. So the Hebrews writer is trying to cover all of these bases, and he just uh, kind of mentions here this verse 
And then he moves into verse 7. So later I'm going to go into Melchizedek. I know you have questions about that. Um, Probably after we get through chapter 7, you'll have even more questions about Melchizedek, and I will too. Um, You know, Melchizedek is just an interesting figure. But I want to move into verse 7 this morning and take a few minutes to consider the sense of verse 7 after giving this overarching view of his priesthood from Aaron and Melchizedek. And then he says, the Hebrews writer says, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. So we can say that this priest and this sense of the priesthood of Christ, he offered up prayers and supplications to the Father. Now, how is it that he did that? Well, the Hebrews writer says he did it in the days of his flesh. What does he mean by in the days of his flesh? Well, uh, Jesus came in time and assumed flesh. That's already been a vital part of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we spent a lot of time dealing with the humanity of Christ. Remember, we've been walking along with the Hebrews writer he's, as he's been building his argument to these Hebrew listeners. Christ is the Son of God, his deity, and he is one who came in the flesh, his humanity. The two natures of Christ have been uh, you know, revealed in proper context through the Hebrews writer, and here Now he's dealing with this coming in flesh, and he's giving a specific context to it. It's about the priesthood. We have to see the the sense of chapter 5. He's now giving us a more proper sense of the priesthood of Christ specifically here in the the humanity of Christ uh, here in chapter 5, dealing with the priesthood. And it's saying that he had to come with a specific task. He had to come. If there was going to be a sacrifice, he had to come in time. If there was going to be a work done on behalf of the people, people, he had to come in time. And so he says, in the days of his flesh. So Jesus came in time and assumed human flesh. Matthew Henry says the flesh of Christ or wherein he was is in the scripture taken, or excuse me, John Owen says the flesh of Christ or wherein he was is in the scripture taken in two ways. Naturally, meaning for his whole human nature. When the Hebrews writer is saying in the days of his flesh, he's noting here that there's something specific about his coming, that it's meaning that Christ came in the whole of his human nature. And that's important to note it was his human nature because remember, he took on the human nature and yet the Hebrews writers always said, already said he did it without sin. He did it without sin. Now that becomes important in the priesthood because all the previous priests, they had to offer sacrifices And could they do that in perfection before the Father? No, they could not. So it specifically speaks here of his flesh, of his whole human nature. John 1.14, the word was made flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. Romans 9.5, of whom was Christ according to the flesh? Hebrews 2.14, he partook of flesh and blood. And we could go on to 1 Peter 3.18 and even Romans 1.3 and other passages as well. The importance of him assuming flesh, he took it on. He partook of flesh and blood. It was his, his to take on and it was his whole human nature. Was it a human nature that was real and actual? Yes. And yet at the same time, it could not be that it was sinful human nature. He took it on rightly in the context of who he is and his subsistence as the very son of God. It was real human nature because he came in the flesh. And this is even in the second context of it. It was 
flesh that was applied to Christ. John Owen once again writes, it signifies the frailties, weaknesses, and infirmities of our nature, of our nature as it is weak and infirm during this mortal life. We need to note that even in the Old Testament, it gives this context to our flesh. And even in prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament, it recognizes that he took on that flesh and blood of man. It once again reminds us of the importance of the humanity of Christ and that we cannot walk away from that truth. You you realize this is always going to be a struggle in our Christian thinking, and it's always going to be a struggle in uh, Christian teaching, and a lot of times people will walk away from it. Just as easy as it is is to walk away from the doctrine of the Trinity because it's such a difficult subject, so it is easy to walk away from the teaching of the two natures of Christ, his deity and his humanity, because it's so difficult. And if we're not careful, if we don't really pay attention to both and rightly understand them, then we will miss out uh, on the understanding and miss out on the context of who Christ is and what he did. If he was just a spirit who came and mingled among us in spirit body somehow, then he could not have really been a high priest because he really couldn't have suffered. He really couldn't have gone through all that the Scripture says that he went through while he was on this earth. Owen later explains, he says, And this is that which is meant by the flesh of Christ in this place. Human nature, not yet glorified, with all its infirmities... He's talking about infirmities. He's talking about the frailness of of the human nature and the body. We know that Christ had the the frailties of that human nature in the sense of his body. Uh, When they nailed him to the cross, he bled. When Lazarus was in the grave, what what does it say about the Lord Jesus thinking of that? He what? He wept. He had the frailties of this human nature and human body. Owen goes on in summation and says, Wherein he was exposed unto hunger, thirst, weariness, labor, sorrow, grief, fear, pain, wounding, and even death itself. You remember, we spent some time going through some of those things biblically back in chapter 2. I try to remind you of those things because chapter 2 has been a while ago. And I realize that as well. The sense of these things is great for us. That Christ came and assumed his human flesh or his human nature in the days of his flesh. Although... He lived this life without sin. He still lived it in the whole of his human nature with the frailties of humanity. And he did it all without sin. As one writer says, it is evident that in general his whole course and walk in this world may be comprised herein. From his cradle to the grave, he bare all the infirmities of our nature with all the dolorous and grievous effects of them. When we think of Christ being the high priest and him walking or tabernacling among us, We have to be reminded that he took on a great work. I think we often take for granted what Christ did in coming to this earth. We, as Christians, and especially maybe 
uh, in, a, in a church that takes the Bible very seriously, we read many passages, we hear of Christ's person and his work quite, quite often. But, but I, I want us to grab hold of how serious it was, our sin, for Christ to come here. Think of all the things that the Son of God had to entertain and deal with. The writer used the word dolorous and grievous effects of them. In one sense, when we talk about that which is grievous, the many sins that are committed against God by every human, each and every moment of the day. How many of you would think, you know, I, I would, how many of you would say, I commit hundreds of sins a day? Raise your hand. How many would say maybe thousands of sins a day? Raise your hand. Yeah. We, we get into numbers and it, it, it gets mind-boggling because there's even sins we don't know about in the sense of when we commit them. Hundreds, thousands of sins committed by you as an individual. And then we take all the individuals in this room, which is, you know, in some sense we're, we're thankful for everyone that's here, but it's not as though this is, you know, 500,000 people. We're, we're, we're looking at, you know, I don't know, 60, 70 people in the room this morning maybe. I don't know who all's in, the, in these other rooms. But l- let's just say 60 people, 6,000 sins committed a day, you get into big, pretty big numbers. When you start talking about the sins of the people committed in the United States of America, over 350 million people, thousands of sins committed a day against the one true living holy God. The work of the high priest must have been very, 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 very serious and grievous. For him to take that on. Not only did he take on that work, but he came and he tabernacled among us as the Son of God. We talked a few weeks ago about the importance of what he did walking among us and all of the things that he had to deal with, dealing with people like us, and yet he never sinned. He never had a sinful interaction with another human. And yet, he was interacting with sinful humans. Oftentimes, our sin is not only from our own nature, but it's composed and intermixed with the sins of those around us, right? And all of that sin compounds. Just to simply say, Christ became the sacrifice and not to think about what that means, I think, I think would be grievous itself. Probably billions of sins upon billions of sins that have been committed down through the ages by God's people. He died for them and he bore the wrath of the Father for those sins. To take that lightly, I think, would be grievous and sad. But not only that sense, of these grievous sins, but just think about the common issue of how distracted we can be even as Christians. The idea of the word dolorous that the author used, the context and the sense of kind of the the dollar of the world. We go ho hum about our day, doing all of the things that we do, and even as Christians, even as those who want to be committed Christians and thoughtful Christians, there are times when we are not focused on the things of God's purpose and His Word. But Christ never had a moment of losing sight of everything he was to do 
here on behalf of his people. He never lost sight of his purpose and context. Christ never had a wandering moment where he went off into the wild blue yonder thinking about things that he wanted to do for himself. This enabled Christ to come and assume not only the flesh, but he assumed the flesh to exact the work of the high priest. He could do something in an exacting measure that no other being could do. No other one could do. And this is, as the author says, in the days of his flesh... He offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. Some people are more emotional than others. Some people are extremely emotional. Some people seem to have the ability to have any emotion whatsoever. And yet the scripture uses language like this apparently without apology, that while the Lord Jesus was on this earth, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears. He was taking the work of a high priest in the greatest of its importance. First of all, we need to note that this is a recognition that Christ himself as he took on human flesh, was in need of prayers and supplications. If this was not a need of Christ and his human nature and his time of assuming the flesh, then why just do it as just something to show? Well, he needed to show that he could do it, so he just did it, but it really had no meaning. It was really not that important. He wept over Lazarus, but it wasn't a real weeping. It meant nothing. It was just kind of a show. These are the words of the Hebrew writer. He offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him. He's giving us a sense, as John Owen notes, to events what he before declared. That in the days of his flesh, when he offered up himself unto God, he was encompassed with the weakness of our nature, which made prayers and supplications needful for him as at all seasons. Was his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane actually needed, or did he just kind of do that as just kind of some symbolism, but it really meant nothing? As the very Son of God, the one being the true God, yet he came in flesh to this very earth. He took on his human nature, and yet that human nature never in any way gave any uh, devolving to his deity. It never took away from his deity. He didn't even lay aside his deity. That's terrible teaching. And yet in his human nature, he needed prayer. He needed supplications. In communing with his father. This is not an emptiness. This is a reality of the human frailty. We are in need of communion with our Heavenly Father, and the only way we gain that communion is through the Son. When we gain that communion through the Son, it is a recognition of the Son's work, that He Himself on this earth, He even prayed. 
We went through the high priestly prayer of John 17. Was that a meaningless prayer? Was Jesus confused or was he modal in some way? No. The Father existing in all time, space, and history from all eternity. The Son existing at a time he never... There was a time when, when he came to this earth and yet he was never in non-existence. He prayed while he was on this earth. He prayed. He prayed with seriousness. The idea of the loud crying and the tears is to give us a sense of the seriousness of the prayer. That our Lord Jesus was not praying empty prayers. He was praying thoughtful prayers, consistent prayers. Mindful prayers. It even gives us a place to understand the prophecies of Psalm twenty-two, twenty-one. As before he was on this earth, it was speaking of him that he would pray in distresses when he cried from the lion's mouth and the horns of the wild oxen that the father would hear him. These prayers and these supplications become important for the high priestly work, not just in the consideration of the shedding of his blood, but they become important for the high priestly work for our own sanctification on this earth after we have repented and believed. If the Lord Jesus himself had prayed and the Father had not heard him or not listened or those prayers not been important in their context, why would we think that the Father would hear our prayers? Why would we think our prayers would be even important? And yet we have these examples that the Lord Jesus himself prayed. And he prayed with seriousness and he prayed with the grievousness of the moment. He prayed as the high priest so that his people could pray. By the power of the Holy Spirit, they could pray, and their prayers would be heard. It doesn't mean that every time we pray a prayer, we pray it in perfection because we don't. But it does mean when we go to the Lord in prayer, he hears the prayers of his people. Because of the sacrificial atoning work of the high priest. The Hebrews writer is just not slogging on here about words and words and blah and blah and blah. He's giving us a context. A context for understanding Christ as high priest that his work was comprehensive and immense. It's Sometimes we just get rote ideas in our brain and we keep it there. But we need to remember what it meant that Christ died for us. It was comprehensive and immense. Millions and millions of sins. Some yet to be committed. Maybe many, depending on how long he tarries. And in his priesthood, he gave us a promise that we can go before our Heavenly Father in his name and approach his throne and pray unto him. And that he will intercede on our behalf, even in our prayers. Doesn't mean he'll answer every prayer the way we want it answered, but it does mean that Son is interceding on behalf of his people. And he shows us that this is true even in his own assuming of human flesh. Be thankful that your high priest not only gave you an understanding of the need of your own prayers, but that he himself prayed. And as a high priest, he continues to intercede on behalf of his people. It ought to give us the greatest of comfort that through the Son, The Father will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you honor and glory.
for you alone sent your one and only Son. We praise the Son as he assumed flesh for all of the purposes of being a high priest. That all of the meanings and the context of living a glorious life unto you would have been exacted and exemplified in the Son because not one of us can live this human life without sin. We praise you, O Father, for the sending of your Son and ask for your Spirit to do a work in us continually that we will grow in the truth of your Word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.